Hello and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and you're watching my video presentation on the poem Glory of Women by Siegfried Sassoon. Let me begin by reading the poem. You love us when we're heroes, home on leave. We're wounded in a mentionable place. You worship decorations. You believe that chivalry redeems the war's disgrace. You make us shells. You listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger fondly thrilled. You crown our distant ardors while we fight and mourn our laureled memories when we're killed. You can't believe that British troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them and they run trampling the terrible corpses blind with blood. O oh, German mother dreaming by the fire, while you are knitting socks to send your son, his face is trodden deeper in the mud. So I think on a first read through, even if we're not sure exactly what's going on, we can sense a great deal of uh, anger, hostility, bitterness in this poem. Let's start with the title, Glory of Women. It doesn't tell us what the situation is. It's not like some poems that tell us who's speaking or, or what exactly is happening. It tells us the subject, though. It tells us what the poem's about. It's about the glory of women. Of course, what does that mean, glory of women? That's an ambiguous phrase. It can and does mean a number of things. Does it mean what women find glorious? Does it mean the glory given by women? The glory given to women? Women as glorious objects? So what does the glory of women consist of? We can see from the first sentence that this is direct address, one person talking to another. We are talking to you. So it's a group voice talking to what seems to be a group you. And we can pretty quickly figure out from the nature of the dialogue what's being, or the nature of the monologue rather, who's talking to whom. This is a soldier, or rather soldiers, speaking to the women back home. And knowing that this was written in 1917, knowing that this was an English soldier, and of course the mention of British troops, positively mentioned, this is an English soldier, or these are the English British soldiers writing to, speaking to their women back home. That could be their mothers, their sisters, their wives, their daughters, etc. All the women back home in England. And again, we know that we see that there's a there's a lot of anger here and there are some uh, words like disgrace and direct accusations like you worship decorations that sounds insulting and you make us shells those are both uh, accusatory and rather negative claims so this seems um, again like the the tone is very angry so what is the genre what is this person doing why are they saying this I would say this is a complaint right? They're complaining about something. They're complaining, particularly, as we'll see, about what the glory of women is. And who are they complaining to? They're complaining to the women themselves. Thinking about it as a complaint raises a number of questions. Again, thinking about the situation. Why do people complain? Well, they complain because they're upset about something. Something bad has happened. Something that they, that they think is probably unfair, usually. And to whom do you complain? Well, sometimes you complain to the people who are the cause of that problem. For example, if uh, you buy, you, you go to a restaurant and your meal is bad, you complain to the waiter, you complain to the manager. If you buy something and you take it home and it's broken, you complain to the store. If someone does something, treats you bad, you complain to them. Of course, you might also complain to your friends, the people that you can vent to. The people, if you can't get, you can't, for example, uh, uh, complain to your boss, because they've been, they'll just continue to treat you poorly, you complain to your friends or your partner. Or sometimes you might complain to the wrong person in the sense that you blame the wrong person. You take it out on someone else. You Someone did you wrong. Again, maybe your boss was uh, uh, rude to you, was mean to you at work, but then you complain to your, your best friend about some minor thing that they did. You take your anger out on them. So complaint is an interesting genre in that, again, we complain to all sorts of different people for different reasons, and they may or may not be deserving of our bitterness. With these questions in mind, let's 
read through the poem again and think, what exactly is the nature of this person's complaint or these soldiers' complaint to the women? Why are they complaining to the women? Do they blame them? And if so, for what? Well, that first sentence says that you love us. That sounds good. But what word qualifies or modifies or maybe undermines the sense that this is a compliment? You love us when we're heroes. And by saying you love us when we do something or when we're a certain way, what is the speaker implying? Perhaps that there's a time when they don't love the soldiers, when they're not being heroic. And what does it mean to not be heroic? Who decides what's heroic or not? How does it feel if you're not loved unconditionally? How does it feel to be loved only for your accomplishments? If your significant other or your parents or your friends only love you because you got good grades or because you made a lot of money or because you did something heroic, but they didn't love you otherwise, how would that make you feel? The second line is another condition. It says you love us when we're wounded in a mentionable place. So there are conditions even on the wounded soldier. You would think the wounded soldier would get unconditional love, but even the wounded soldier only gets love in certain circumstances. We'll come back to this line later to think about some ambiguities in the phrasing and the meaning of this line. So here, the soldiers are saying, you love us, yes, but only in certain circumstances. So it's an accusation. Again, there's that bitterness. You don't love us for who we are. You love us only for these certain circumstances, certain accomplishments. And that is reinforced by the next two lines. You worship decorations. We might That might bring to mind thinking about heroes. Decorations, well, a hero is decorated with medals. So reiterating, you love only the heroic. You love us if we come back with a bunch of medals, but if not, we're not worthy. Thinking about being a soldier coming back from war, how would that make you feel to not to be rejected or to not feel as if you're loved because you didn't do enough, you didn't sacrifice enough, you didn't fight hard enough, you didn't kill enough. You believe that chivalry redeems the war's disgrace. So if he says this is what the women believe, that they believe chivalry outweighs all the disgrace and horror of war, what does he believe? What do they believe, the soldiers who are speaking? By implication, they probably believe the opposite, right? Why? Well, because they've been there. They've been in the war. They've experienced the horrors of it, and they find it disgraceful. Let's move on to the next lines. You make us shells. I'll come back to that little phrase in a, in a moment, but again, it's another accusation about them, and it, and it seems to be even without going into details or unpacking it, it's an accusation about them doing something bad, some hurting the soldiers. You listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger, fondly thrilled. So what is the war to the women? Here he's describing their attitude. They are delighted by it. They are fondly thrilled by it. And what does what does the war mean to them? Well, it's just tales stories. What does it mean, on the other hand, to the soldiers? It's reality. And so the horrors that the men have gone through are just delightful, amusing stories to thrill the women. So think about, I hope you can hear the bitterness, the anger in this, in their voices here. We'll talk about if that anger is justified, but at least I want you to experience it. So he's emphasizing that they have, the men had the immediate experience of the war while the women, to them, it's a, it's a story, it's a tale. They are safely distant from it. And that's reiterated again, the next two lines, you crown our distant ardors. Ardors means enthusiasm or enthusiastic uh, uh, actions. You crown our distant ardors while we fight and mourn our laureled memories when we're killed. Laureled memories of the laurel wreath is the wreath traditionally given in ancient Rome to uh, uh, vic uh, great victorious generals. So the laurel wreath is another crown, and it's a, a, a crown of honor. So here, what 
is happening. What are the women doing to the men? Well, they're crowning them. They're mourning them. They're giving them these uh, 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 gifts of symbolic gifts, perhaps. But where are the men? The men are away. The men are distant. There are just memories. So only when they are dead, only when they are gone, do they receive these crowns. Only when they're dead do the women show them love in mourning, show that they care. So these were, and this is a, a, an echo back to the decorations that were worshipped at the beginning, right? What good are decorations, medals, crowns? What good are fond memories? What good is mourning and crying to the dead soldier? What does he care? That's the, I think, the bitterness underlying all these accusations, again, towards the women. There's a shift in the next line. In the first eight lines, the speakers have been talking about what the women do. You love us, you worship, you believe, you make, you listen, you crown, you mourn. These are all the things that the women do. But now we see what the women don't do or can't do. You can't believe. And what is it that they can't believe? That British troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them and they run, trampling the terrible corpses, blind with blood. Think about what the speakers are describing here. What are we seeing? When hell's last horror breaks them, the horrors of war, when they're broken by war, what we might call today PTSD, the psychological suffering that war inflicts on the survivors, what do they do? They run. What do soldiers do in moments, even the bravest soldier might do in moments of extreme terror or extreme uh, um, danger? Run, blinded by blood, trampling corpses. Is this very heroic? This isn't the traditional image of heroism, but it's the reality of war. And that's what the women don't believe, these soldiers say. You don't believe it. You don't believe that the British soldiers retire. And he puts retire in quotation marks. Why? What is it, what is suggested by quotation marks around a word? Well, it undermines the truth of that word, suggests a certain irony. Retire here is a polite euphemism for being committed, being broken mentally. Again, that extreme PTSD from war. So the women don't believe that. Oh, they love the heroes. They love the wounded. They worship all the decorations. They're delighted by the tales of bravery and chivalry. But when you say, the war was horrible and I was broken by it and I ran and I trampled corpses just to get a lot, just to survive, they can't believe that or they don't want to believe that. So they ignore the horrors. And why might the soldiers be bitter about that? What do they want from the women? What does anyone want who's been through trauma, who's been through suffering? There's a suggestive switch in the last three lines. Again, another switch. Where now the speakers go from talking to you, the British women, back home, to... Oh, German mother, very specific, a single mother standing in here most definitely for all German mothers and beyond that, all mothers. But speaking specifically to one mother and a German mother, the mother of the enemy, a mo the mother of a soldier on the opposite side, the side that we are at war with. And he says, O oh, German mother, dreaming by the fire while you are knitting socks to send your son. That's a, a wonderfully nostalgic image. What a traditional, motherly, loving thing to do, to be knitting socks for your son. How caring, how simple, but how loving. And how, again, stereotypically maternal. So this is what the speaker imagines the German mother doing, and then he violently interrupts that memory. While you're knitting socks for your son, 
His face is trodden deeper in the mud. He's one of the corpses that I and my fellow soldiers trampled while we were fleeing the battlefield, while we were running for our lives. Perhaps even the soldier that these speakers killed by these speakers. But reaching out to them and saying, almost trying to comfort this mother. Perhaps comfort himself. Because what does he not get from the women, or what do they not get from the women that they were speaking to initially? They only get, again, they get conditional love. Love when you're heroes. Love when you're wounded in a mentionable place. Love if you have decorations. Not if you're broken by the war. Not if you ran. Not if you weren't a hero in the traditional sense. So what, does, what do these soldiers want? They want perhaps the love of their mothers. The mother that kisses your boo-boos, that makes it all better, that cares for you. Not getting that mother at home, they look across to the mother of the enemy. And so it's a, a tragic sort of seeking some sort of love, and yet he can on, the only woman he can think they can think to seek it from is the mother of the enemy, the mother whose son they've killed. That tragic irony takes us back, I think, to the title, Glory of Women. And what's the tragic, horrible irony of the glory of women? Well, if all these, all these things that the speaker has been describing define the glory of women, the women are glorified by the soldiers coming home, the heroic soldiers. The women perhaps show off their heroic son or husband to their neighbors and friends. The women glory in the tales of dirt and danger. But what is that glory premised on? Where does that glory come from? It comes from another mother's sorrow, another mother whose sons are dead. So that's that the horror of war and the bitterness. And the, that horror is what informs the speaker's bitterness. And that bitterness is expressed throughout the poem in a relentless irony, a relentlessly ironic tone where everything is twisted into its opposite. And we can see that extend to the level of the language itself and the, the images that he uses. Let's think about some of the more ambiguous phrases. Wounded in a mentionable place. Well, what does it mean to be, what is a mentionable place? Does that mean a mentionable geographic location? Like wounded at a major battle? Gettysburg, D-Day, the Battle of Troy? What else might it mean to be injured in a mentionable place? Or perhaps, let's say, men injured in an unmentionable place. What injury might a man sustain? What unmentionable injury might a man sustain that women would not want to talk about? That he would not want to talk about? That wouldn't be something to brag about in polite society? How might that make the man feel about himself? That injury and the embarrassment, the shame of the injury in an unmentionable place? How might he feel about his masculinity? And what do the women see in him? Do the women see him as a hero or as no longer a man? Another wonderfully ambiguous phrase, you make us shells. Well, we might think on the one hand, this means you make us into shells. You turn us into shells. Shells being what? Hollow. A shell is something hollow, something empty, something false. You only love us for our decorations. You only love us for the appearance of heroes. You make us into hollow beings. You don't care about what's inside. You don't care about the suffering. You only care about the appearance of chivalry. But what else might it mean you make us shells? Thinking about the phrase, you make us dinner. Not saying you turn me into dinner, saying you're making dinner for us. You make shells for us. Now, I don't know historically if in World War I there were many women involved in the manufacturing, the military manufacturing process, but certainly in World War II there were. Women be took on a major role in the war effort in the United States and in other countries. Perhaps in England during World War I the same thing happened. Even if it didn't, even if that's not an ambiguity meant by the poet, it's a 
powerful ambiguity for us because what is this poem about? What is the speaker so angry about? The women, in some sense, he's blaming them for the war. They're involved in the war, in sending him off to, to war. He has to do this for them, for their glory, is the perspective that the speakers are giving. And so we see that literally women were involved in the war effort, in World War II at least, and again, I think probably World War I. And that takes us to the question, I think, of is this bitterness justified? Is this complaint justified? Are the targets of this complaint the people he should be complaining to? Let's ask another question. Who is he not complaining to? Who are the soldiers not complaining about? Whose actions aren't they blaming? They're not blaming any other men. They're not blaming the generals, the politicians. They're not blaming the fathers, nor are they asking for relief from the fathers. So I would argue, and this is something where we're going beyond the poem, the intended meaning of the poem, I think. I think this poem is a very bitter personal expression on behalf of one soldier. The poet was, the actual poet was in, in his life, a, a soldier in World War I. And this was his experience and probably the experience of many soldiers at the time, going home and feeling uh, uh, betrayed by the women, feeling as if they're, they were only loved as heroes. But he doesn't blame the people really responsible. Yes, there is a sense in which these women are part of the culture that glorifies war and violence and that loves men only for, values men only for their violent abilities, for their strength, and doesn't care for, accept, love men who are vulnerable or who are broken or who are emotional. So the women are involved in that. But I would say that as a complaint, what this poem really does is show us how complaints are sometimes misdirected. Because it really isn't the women at fault. It's the men making the decisions, declaring the war. And I say men because, historically speaking, this is a time when the government of, uh, the, of England was pretty much dominated by men. Some women involved, of course, royal family, things like that. But... They don't blame the men. They don't blame the fathers. They only blame the people who they can blame, the women. We blame the people closest to us often because they're the ones that we can blame, right? You yell, you take out your anger at your boss on your spouse or your friend because they're there, because you have a certain power over them, whereas you can't, as a soldier perhaps, talk back to the general talk back to the politician. You can't complain to the people really at fault. You misdirect that energy. So to review a little bit and go back to the beginning, this is a poem I think that relies on ambiguity and duplicity in the sense of double meanings or multiple meanings. From the title, Glory of Women, which could be a number of things, to the, the split within the soldiers of the heroic front and the tragic, injured, suffering internal self. The split between the, the ironic uh, uh, reaching out across war, across the nations to the German mother and the various symbols or uh, ambiguous phrases, mentionable place, decorations. Who are the decorations that they, that they worship? Both the medals that the men are decorated with and the men themselves who become a sort of decoration. The shells, the making shells, all these ambiguities, all these uh, uh, lines with multiple meanings. And I think ultimately that ambiguity and the, the relentless irony is turned back on the poem itself, on the speakers themselves to reveal the, the misdirected nature of their complaint that again, the women, the mothers, daughters, sisters, wives are not the ones to blame for war's disgrace 
and that it's what the men aren't seeing, the people that they're not talking to, the fathers that they're not calling out to for help or love that are really the ones sending them off to death. And that's, I think, a rather tragic irony. So on that cheerful note, thank you so much for watching. I hope it helped. If you have any questions, feel free to comment, email, you know how to get in touch. I wish you the day you wish yourselves and take care.